Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, and it's about leadership, character, and creating a superior culture of excellence. My special guest today is the president and CEO of our Hawaii Chamber of Commerce and a candidate for Lieutenant Governor. She is Sherry Menor McNamara, and today we are going beyond leadership. Hey, Sherry, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Aloha, good to see you, and thank you for having me. Sherry, you are, you, you're such a successful person. You've been doing so many things to help so many businesses, but I want to first start off by asking you if you can tell me a bit about your background growing up. Sure. So not too many people know that I was born in Tokyo, uh, but pretty much raised in Hilo all my life until I turned 18 and went away for college. I went to public school, Hilo Union, uh, Waikia Intermediate, Waikia High School. I uh, had uh, so much fun during those days. I uh, played on the tennis team. Uh, probably not as good as you, <laughs> but I uh, played on a tennis team, was captain of my tennis team, did one year of cheerleading uh, and was very involved in student government. Uh, and then after that, after uh, I went away to college at UCLA, uh, stayed on the continent for eight years, Japan for two years, and finally made my way back home. But I would attribute who I am today based on my upbringing. Uh, my mom was born and raised in Japan, uh, moved to Hawaii not knowing any English, not having any friends. Uh, and years later, after raising three kids, actually during raising three kids, uh, she started her own small business, a travel agency. And 40 years later, she still has that small uh, business in Hilo. Uh, my dad was born in, uh, on Hawaii Island, and but his grandparents immigrated from the, his parents rather, my grandparents immigrated from the Philippines uh, and brought their two children over. At that time, my grandpa was a laborer and uh, six, five kids later uh, raised their kids in a small town called Pahoa. And my grandpa was unfortunately laid off, but he saved enough money to buy a papaya farm. And that papaya farm had everything from tangerines, oranges, macadamia, anthuriums, bananas, breadfruit, you name it. Uh, I remember growing up spending summers there. And of course, grandpa and grandma would put us to work, my brother and I. Uh, we would catch a heli-on bus from Hilo uh, to Pahoa, where my grandpa would pick us up in this green Datsun truck. I can still picture it uh, in town and bring us to their farm again, putting us to work. Uh, and we raised our allowance that way. But what my grandpa and grandma also did was uh, tender to that farm to put food on the table for the family, uh, sell that to the community. Uh, but also what, what really taught me about giving back about community where were their values of really helping one another. Uh, so when their neighbors were not doing so well, they would bring the, the fruits and vegetables to their, or even uh, pig meat, because they raised pigs too, to their neighbors or even to the community just to give away because they knew how important it was to support their community because they're, they're benef beneficiaries of being able to move to the United States and earn uh, and live that American dream, similar to my mom. So again, a lot of my upbringing has shaped me to who I am today. And I'm, I'm certainly proud and humbled by that fact. Well, Sherry, you're a woman of great character and you're a local girl, played tennis. I mean, <laughs> that, that's amazing. <laughs> it was a lot of fun those days. I was a better uh, uh, doubles player, though, rather than single uh, singles. But I don't know. What about you? <laughs> well, you know, it's good to, to know how to play doubles. I like singles and doubles. And, mm -hmm. and Sherry, you know, I know you very well now for some years now. And and can you share about what jobs you, you've had before becoming president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce here in Hawaii? Sure. So I would say I had a lot of fun jobs, uh, but they're very short term because at that stage of my life, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I, there's always that singular 
path where someone knows that exactly what they want to do and they go for it. For me, it was about exploring to find out what's out there uh, and to make that connection. And I didn't make that connection until I returned. But some of the fun jobs I had, I worked for Elton John. <laughs> Yes, a musician. Uh, I worked for Sony Pictures Entertainment. I worked for Estee Lauder in the PR department. Um, I did a couple of uh, summer jobs with the President of the United States, uh, President Clinton, uh, as well as uh, for Senator Daniel Okaka. Uh, and then finally, uh, my last job before moving back home was uh, moving to Japan, uh, working for the Sony Open or Sony Corporation, I should say, but they hired me to work on the Sony Open. So it was between 1998 and 2000. Uh, and those two years, while I lived in Japan, I was able to come back home on a regular basis, uh, at least to Honolulu. Uh, and that's when I recognized after two years, it was time to move back, uh, move back to Hawaii uh, and really uh, stay here moving forward. And that was in 2000. And when I came back, I didn't have a job. <laughs> so that's when I decided, okay, you know what? I think I'll go back to school. So I went to law school. First year, decided, okay, I am not going to be alert. This is not my thing, but I already put one year in and decided to stick it through. Uh, and then it was my third year. And I said, well, if I'm not going to go to into law, what about if I go to business school and see what it's like there? So I added another year. So it was a four-year program where I got my master's in business administration and my uh, law degree, same time. But Rusty, it was during that time I had a couple of jobs. Uh, so I went to law school in the morning, worked two jobs, and then in the evening went to business school. Uh, one was for the Sheraton Hawaii Bowl, and the other was actually working at the state capitol as a committee clerk and as a law, uh, uh, administrative aide, or legal aide, not legal, uh, legislative aide rather. And it was during that time where I saw how the policy making process um, and how it impacted people. And that's when I decided, okay, this is an area I want to uh, start my career in. Uh, and so that's when I sent my resumes to all these different law firms who had government affairs division, but no one responded except for one. And that one said, well, I don't have a position, but I want to have coffee with you and uh, talk story because I see you have all these experiences. I just want to hear your story. And so we met and then lo and behold, uh, a week later, she said, hey, there's a job at the Chamber of Commerce opening up. And I had no idea what the Chamber of Commerce was all about. So I did some research and I saw that the mission was to support business. And because my mom owns a small business in Hilo, uh, I immediately connected to that. And 16 years later, I am still at the Chamber of Commerce, uh, eight years as president and CEO. Well, Sherry, what I love is, you know, you're so well-rounded. You have so many different experiences and I, I'm friends with your husband, John McNamara, and I want to ask you about him because you guys make such a great team together. What, what, what trait do you admire most about John? He's a dog lover like me. No, just joking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, tease me. we just got a puppy. Her name is Bubbles. And I keep telling him she's so independent and feisty and just active. And he said, well, he is taking after his mommy. <laughs> so our <laughs> other dog, Kumachan, he's very uh, low key, laid back, just go with the flow. Uh, and that kind of describes John. He's very um, in a go with the flow and very supportive. Uh, he, he, he's, he accepts my, uh, my, uh, I guess, aspirations and supports me along the way. Uh, and I know there's more than one, but that's what I love about him is that he's just been so supportive along, along the way. And we've been together since 2004, married in 2007. Uh, so going on 15 years, uh, but he's just a patient, supportive, uh, wonderful guy uh, and funny too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I mean, he he is everything that you said. I mean, and he's super funny. He loves loves your dogs. And and now that you're on this journey for you know the campaign for lieutenant governor, tell me why, Sherry. Wh why are you running for lieutenant governor? Yeah, Rusty. You know, the past couple of years uh, have been obviously so 
challenging and devastating for our families, uh, for our local and small businesses. Uh, and at the chamber, we've seen firsthand the past couple of years, the, the devastating impact COVID had on our local business community. Uh, and I just felt that during that time, there wasn't enough that was being done. And whether it's a lack of communication, lack of resources, a lack of connection to the community. And overall, when we look at the cost of living, cost of doing business uh, and affordable housing, nothing has gotten better. And so I look at it as a way, as a fresh start for Hawaii, um, having new leaders at the table. And that's why I decided to make the run for Lieutenant Governor. But I could have I can easily stay here at the chamber and continue my position here uh, and continue to support our local uh, businesses. But I just felt that it was my responsibility to broaden my scope uh, and give back to help Hawaii uh, get back on a path towards economic recovery. Uh, so that's why I decided to run for Lieutenant Governor is to have that first start for Hawaii, bring in new leadership, bring in new and bold ideas uh, and new direction for our state so that it becomes a much healthier and more resilient state uh, uh, for our future. I like that you said about fresh ideas and what, what advantages do you feel you have being a non-politician? Yeah, you said it. I'm not a career politician. In fact, this is my first time running. But, you know, as you know, anytime you run a business, you don't want to have it status quo and be comfortable with the same ideas, same decision makers, same everything. We always need new perspectives. And that's where I come in without having that... Um, political baggage uh, as you may and just co coming in with a, a fresh perspective into uh, discussing some really challenging issues so that's one uh, the other one bringing in that business experience uh, we need to come up with common sense solutions and that's what as the chamber we've been doing is coming up with common sense solutions uh, to get our economy back on track, uh, working with different stakeholders on a local, state and federal levels. So I've been able to establish and strengthen those relationships. So I wanna leverage those relationships into bringing it to the table uh, and coming up with common sense uh, and, and sustainable solutions. And three, as I said, I mentioned earlier, I'm from Hilo. Uh, so I bring in that neighbor island perspective. And a lot of times, and I've seen it firsthand where a lot of the policies are very Oahu centric. Uh, and we need to ensure that the voices across the islands from the northern tip of Kauai of Hanalei down to the southern tip of Hawaii Island of Na'alehu and across every community in between, that their voices are heard and brought to the table so that we can move forward as a more unified uh, and balanced state. Well, I like that you said common sense because we can't take common sense for granted nowadays. And Sherry, I want to ask you, so you mentioned about some issues. What, what are some specific issues you want to improve? Yeah, so my focus and because of my experience is economic recovery, because as we come out of this pandemic, we need to uh, ensure that we're not going to go back to where we were. We realize how reliant we were on tourism. And although we need to continue to support our number one industry, how can we do better? How can we manage better? How can we ensure, though, that experience uh, continues to be the best that Hawaii is known for? Uh, but Beyond that is how can we ensure that we can get back and become more resilient? And those are kind of questions we need to ask. So how can you connect tourism to our other existing industry from our manufacturing industry to energy, to natural environment? Uh, we have so many wonderful industries uh, and businesses doing great things. So how can we interconnect all these industries better? We also need to expand our job opportunities because as you saw again, 200,000 plus jobs were lost overnight. And we cannot let that happen because that impacted so many families uh, and so many families putting food on the table. So how can we ensure that those who lost a job can get other types of jobs that are well-paying, 
uh, and more sustainable for them. So helping with the reskilling. Uh, and so those are two areas I believe I can bring to the table based on my experience. And that will be critical to build back uh, better in a much more resilient and strong way. And I will continue to support our local and small businesses because they are the heartbeat of our economy. They are the, the livelihood of our communities, especially our mom and pop restaurants, stores, businesses. Um, they are the ones that keep it going, find the jobs, uh, and really um, supporting the community as a whole. Uh, and so that will be my commitment as well to continue to be the voice of small businesses. I like I like hearing that you know those specific examples that you said in those areas. And Sherry, I mean, you you're there firsthand with these businesses. Why why did some businesses not succeed during the pandemic and why did others succeed? I mean, it, it's almost like the ones that didn't almost had like a vic victim mindset where the ones that succeeded had a victor mindset where they were just trying to find a way to adapt and adjust and find a way to, to win and survive. What are your thoughts? Yeah, you said it. Um... Uh, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, what we've seen for the businesses that we're able to keep their doors open, not without its challenges, um, because many of this, these businesses use their personal savings, uh, took out loans, uh, amongst other ways to ensure that the doors could get stay open uh, and the jobs kept. Uh, but many of them, uh, the ones that continue to stay open, we're able to pivot. Uh, I know when we, during the pandemic, uh, thanks to the governor, he supported uh, our Hawaii Business Pivot Program. Uh, and that was a program where it provided financial support to businesses who did pivot, uh, who were able to adjust and not keep the same business model and the way they operated. Uh, because as we know, during the pandemic, we saw many restaurants go online. They started selling groceries. Uh, who would have thought, right? Uh, we saw some manufacturers selling other, the competitors' products in their store on the line. Uh, and so another one, I think Eden Love went directly pivoted online 100% and did not and decide to uh, shut down their uh, brick and mortars. But it's a way the business pivoted quickly uh, that they were able to survive during the pandemic. And another thing I observe is a lot of uh, a sense of collaboration and community. And I say that again over and over because that's what we saw. It was about forget this individual mindset. It's about, okay, what can we do to support the community? So many businesses work together. Uh, and I think we talked earlier about um, Maui Brewery Company, Koloa Rum. They were impacted obviously by their uh, by the pandemic, but they knew they had to step up to keep the doors open, but also give back to the community. And that time, sanitizers were in demand. So they quickly pivoted to not only sell rum during that time, but also to sell, make sanitizer and sell them or give it away. Uh, so again, it's that sense of community, I think, and that kept the doors open. Murphy's Bar and Grill is another perfect example. Uh, it was about them to give back, even though they were struggling itself. So circling that, it was those that were able to pivot uh, and this Hawaii Business Pivot Program uh, enabled them to uh, cover some costs that were not budgeted. <laughs> No, I, I like I like hearing those insights from you. And Sherry, you you had an opportunity to meet with former Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, and when you met with him, what what kind of impressions did you get from him? What what did you learn from that experience? You, know, you didn't get to talk long, but it was uh, it was I it was obvious that he loved Hawaii. Uh, he's down to earth. Uh, and he really wanted to establish uh, the relationship and strengthen the relationship between Hawaii and Japan. It's a funny story. This is, uh, gosh, a couple of years ago, we took a business group, uh, some members to Japan, uh, and one of the visits was with Prime Minister Abe. It was at his residence. 
So it was with his cabinet, it was with our members and Speaker Psyche also um, led that delegation. Uh, his delegation were there at the same time and we got invited to visit with the prime minister. It wasn't until we actually sat down, someone whispered in my ear, um, be prepared, you're gonna have to say a few words. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna say if I'd known? I would be prepared, but talk about, <laughs> Just trying to think of the right things to say, selecting the right words, and you only had five minutes to think of something. <laughs> I, uh, my back was sweating so profusely because I was so nervous and speaking to the prime minister, but you know what? I just had, I quickly pivoted. It was all about Hawaii. And all I did was talk about Hawaii uh, and again, emphasizing the important relationship between Japan and Hawaii. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, yeah, that was, I think, the most <laughs> uh, exciting, but yet <laughs> frightening moment. <laughs> well, Sherry, Sherry, I, I know you're a pressure player and I know you rise to the occasion and, and it sounded like you rose to the occasion right then and there again. And and I and I Sherry, you have both of my books. I want to ask you, what are some things that stood out to you in the books? Yeah, you know, I. So this is the one I'm going to reference to, but there's a couple of um, communication because communication is so critical uh, from nonverbal as well as uh, verbal. And I like the way you laid it out, you know, um, it's about how the words you use, right? It, 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 and how the, the number of words you use too. Uh, I, I get it when you mention, oh, 30 minutes, you're listening to someone, but you have no idea what they're saying. But you can listen to someone for five minutes and the impact of the words they use, it can make all the difference, right? Uh, and communication leads to trust and um, um, I guess relationships because it's all about how you communicate. And then the other, what I also, emphasize is a nonverbal aspect of it though, because a lot of times when you talk to someone, you want to look them in the eye, but when you see the eyes wandering elsewhere, you don't feel as connected. And I think that's referenced in your book too, right? How you connect with someone. And a lot has to do with the communication and the nonverbal. So that I've, I agree with everything you have laid out in that chapter, but the other one is mindset. Uh, and more and more, I feel that is so critical to how you perform. Uh, I'll give you an example we talked about earlier, but the marathon. <laughs> oh, wow. It was, so this, I ran a marathon this past uh, December. It was my fifth marathon, but I haven't done one in 10 years. Uh, and I will admit I did not train for it. I, mean, I do exercise every day. So I do run. Uh, do the bicycle and do weight training, but I did not train for it. So in the first eight miles, or first three miles, you're just on a high. Yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. The mindset was so positive, right? You got the energy, you got the fireworks going. Uh, and then going on to the eighth, 12 mile, like, okay, now I'm starting to ache, but no, you just got to do it. got to keep pushing forward because your body can still take it. Fast forward to about the last five miles, you can see sort of the horizon of where the end is, but the body completely shuts down. And there are moments like, okay, I, I think I just got to sit. I, I called John, can you pick me up on the 20th mile? But I, you know, I said, no, nope. I signed up for this. I see so many volunteers here helping, waking up early, helping. I see people cheering the marathon runners on. I see those that, are in pain, but continue to persevere and push forward. So putting all those factors in my mindset is what got me to the finish line, not without pain, not without challenges, but it's having that can-do mindset, that positive mindset um, really makes a huge difference. And when you have that, I mean, that could be in your career, that could be personal, but it seems so... Um, simple. I mean, it's one word mindset, but it can be transformative. Well, I, I'm so happy that you mentioned mindset and communication from the books and because those are so huge. And, and you know, as leaders, that's what we're trying to instill in, in our team, in our people. 
And I'm, I'm impressed that you, you ran the Honolulu Marathon, Sherry. And Sherry, I want to ask you, you know, when you reflect back on your life so far, what's the best advice you ever received? The best advice um, is just believing in myself. You know, I, I growing up, uh, I think everyone goes through it, but self-confidence issues. Uh, and just through the challenges, sometimes you are questioned or challenged by some of the obstacles. Um, but just believing yourself. And Rusty, I found I have this book that I got from my 10th grade teacher, and I still have it 30 plus years later. And she wrote a note in there. And if I may just take a 30 seconds to read sure. what she said and dedicated this specific <clears throat> poem to me, but it says, sometimes the world seems cold. These are moments when you try your best and even that isn't good enough. You yearn for the best life has to offer, but you wonder if it will ever appear. But you have to keep believing. You have to remember that things will get better, that you will find strength and you have to believe in yourself the way I believe in you. And it's, for me, it's very powerful because there are moments that I didn't, I will admit, um, but when you reinforce to yourself that you need to believe in yourself, because once you believe in yourself, then you can do better with confidence. And that's what I believe about our state. We have to believe in our state and our people because we can do better. Uh, and so I go back to my 10th grade uh, English teacher um, who gave me this. And, it, you know, when I found it, uh, I just it just resonated. It just resonated with me, and it, it was just that aha moment. No, I, I love hearing that. I mean, that, that's great advice. I mean, just, you know, believing in yourself because, you know, doubt is a confidence killer. And Sherry, I want to ask you, um, you know, what's, what's the best or what's the biggest adversity or challenge that you dealt with in your life, and how did you overcome it? Wow. Uh, I will say the past couple of years, it was seeing how impacted our local small businesses. Um, I got, I, and I, I get kind of emotional about it because you know, I get during that time, I've seen the pressure it had on our team to ensure that we could support our members uh, during a critical and most, one of the darkest times I think anyone has faced. Uh, not a, Day went by where we didn't get an email, text, phone call. Uh, many from businesses who are well-established institutions, but they're pretty much on their last string of survival. And at times, I felt just the hands were tied. Right? There's not. There's only certain things we could do as a chamber. Um, but it, it, it was just that helplessness that felt I, I don't, it's hard to describe because I just felt it um and just seeing how it was impacting everyone their employees their families uh and that's why we stepped up our efforts we said you know what? we're gonna have to continue to advocate become louder really stay firm to ensure that the government provided the resources necessary to support our lo local businesses, to support our working families. Uh, so we're pretty loud. And I will say that it got the attention and fortunately the governor did support some of our programs that we proposed to him. One of them was the Hawaii Restaurant Card Program. We came up with the program, actually, actually one of our board members, he and I were just sitting around and felt helpless, but he said, you know what? We're not getting any answers. Let's just come up with ideas. And it was around a coffee table and we scribbled it out and we came up with the concept was Aloha Butts, but it turned out to be the Hawaii Restaurant Car Program. And we're so proud of that because it helped stabilize the entire restaurant industry as well as entire supply chains from the farmers, the ranchers, the distributors, but it also saved 2000 plus jobs, put food on the table, had some families who lost their jobs to be able to go to restaurants uh, their favorite mom and pop restaurant or to a restaurant that they couldn't afford before. But this glimmer of hope, wow, I got this during the darkest times. Uh, that, that was um, a, a, feel, a highlight of what advocacy can do. Uh, 
Um, but going back to your question, I think the last couple of years were absolutely the most challenging of, of I think, my career and this overall. No, oh, that's that's for sure. And and Sherry, you know, I right there. I mean, it, you just showed how much you care about what you do, and that's really why you're such a great leader. And I want to thank you for taking time to join me on the show today. So well, thank you for the opportunity. Opportunity always good talking story with you, Rusty. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit rustykomori.com. And my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I hope that Sherry and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.